Smith. I'm a film critic and historian, and the author of In Lonely Places, Film Noir Beyond the City. Welcome to this commentary on Fritz Lang's The Woman in the Window. This film was released in 1944, the same year as Double Indemnity, Laura, and Murder My Sweet, which make up the first real wave of film noir, as the style was dubbed by French critics at the end of World War II, when they were able to catch up with wartime American films and notice this distinctive new type of crime thriller with an expressionistic visual style and psychological themes of anxiety, alienation, and paranoia. The Woman in the Window has even been called a film noir about film noir. Director Fritz Lang always cited it as one of his favorites among his own films, and it was one of the most popular thanks to a terrific cast, tight script by Melanie Johnson, and some unforgettable scenes and images. This opening scene introduces the protagonist, Professor Richard Wanley, played by Edward G. Robinson, giving a lecture on some psychological aspects of homicide, a noir topic if ever there was one. Also note the Venetian blind shadows that are being cast across the room, a favorite lighting motif to suggest entrapment or imprisonment. The craze for Freud in the 1940s was a major component in the development of noir, and on the blackboard are Freudian terms like libido, ambivalence, unconscious, and id, which will all prove significant. Wanley is talking about the different categories of murder, for profit or in self-defense, and the differing degrees of culpability. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what's known as foreshadowing. Like a lot of noir films, this one sets up the wholesome and ordinary life of the protagonist for contrast with the story that follows. Here Wanley is at Grand Central Terminal seeing his wife and children off as they leave on a summer vacation. This is the only time that we ever see his family, although pictures of his wife and kids will later be prominent in several scenes. What we get is neither an idealized vision of family life, nor something that's presented as soul-killing. This is just a typical middle-aged couple whose relationship seems close but unromantic. Antsy kids who don't pay much attention to them. The child actor playing his son, incidentally, is Robert Blake. So we're ready to believe both that Wanley genuinely cares about his family and that he might be happy to take a little break from them. The Woman in the Window was shot on studio backlots and sound stages, but Lang went to New York to do some research on locations, and there is some second unit background footage. Here we get the first glimpse of The Woman in the Window, the image that will spark the whole plot. This film belongs to one of my favorite subgenres, the portrait noir. Laura, from the same year, is probably the best-known example, and the portrait of Joan Bennett is very similar to the picture of Jean Tierney in that film, which was actually a touched-up photograph. In both pictures, the women are wearing strapless black dresses with a filmy shawl covering one shoulder. Their hair is almost identically styled, and both are positioned so they're slightly turned away but gazing directly at the viewer with a somewhat enigmatic but soft, open, and inviting look. Whether one actually influenced the other is not really important. The point in both cases is that these are feminine ideals, in this first scene, Wanley's friends, who are laughing at him for his crush on the picture, call her their dream girl. That cliché is particularly apt here, since as we'll see, the portrait inspires Wanley's dream, which starts out as a very standard male fantasy and then turns into a nightmare, suggesting that male desire for beautiful women is fraught with fear and latent violence. And that, in a much more jokey way, is also the subject of the conversation these three men are having at their club, the Burgers Club, which indicates their social position. The professions of these friends are pointedly chosen. Wanley is a professor of psychology, Frank Layler, played by Raymond Massey, is a district attorney, and Michael Barkston, played by Edmund Brion, is a doctor. So they all, in their different ways, are professionally concerned with physical, mental, and moral health and the things that can go wrong with them. As the friends are teasing Wanley about his summer bachelorhood, there's a very old-school, sexist tone to the assumption that 
With the wife away, the husband will play around and have a little adventure, at least see a burlesque show or go to a nightclub. But they're also talk talking like about that. feeling middle-aged, feeling a no sense of solidity and stodginess, being like athletes out of, condition. Like athletes are out of condition. And the DA has this well, speech where he talks about all the tragedies and crimes he sees that are caused by what we would now call midlife crises, by a moment of carelessness and idle flirtation. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what's known as more foreshadowing. The basis for this film was a 1942 novel by Mr. History writer J. H. Wallace called Once Off Guard. The title sums up the theme, and Lang said in a 1945 interview that the picture followed to a perfectly logical conclusion the events that can follow even one second of being off guard. The book was adapted by Nunnally Johnson, who also co-produced the film. He and former Fox executive William Getz had joined forces to form the independent production company International Pictures. Johnson's script follows the book fairly closely, with one major exception, the ending, which I'll talk about later, but it has a somewhat different tone overall. The book has a very claustrophobic, relentlessly downbeat tone as we are completely trapped in the psyche of the professor, or as Johnson wanted to lighten the tone. He was a southerner who was known for folksiness and humor. He collaborated several times with John Ford, most notably on The Grapes of Wrath, and often wrote about rural settings. So this was something of a departure, his first venture into noir, though he would later write The Dark Mirror and Witness to Murder. Johnson wanted Lang to direct, but they fought over the script, and Johnson claimed it was much funnier on the page and that Lang, whom he called humorless, had not captured that. <laughs> Indeed, these recurring scenes with the three friends have a quality of being sort of jocular and facetious without actually being funny, though it's hard to say whether that's because of the script, the direction, or the performers, and arguably it's appropriate to the sort of stodgy middle-aged male dynamic of this group, especially the doctor's rather nauseating, lecherous jokes about young women. For his part, Edward G. Robinson said this, that this script was one of the most perfect he was ever associated with. Lang scoffed at his claim that it was so good it went through almost no changes. Lang said he fought like hell with Johnson over the script and that Robinson had only seen the final shooting version. One of the main things they fought over was the ending. The book ends with the protagonist committing suicide, ironically after he has just been saved, unbeknownst to him. The studio nixed that ending since the production code would not allow suicide, nor would it allow a character who has committed murder to get off scot-free. So Getz apparently was the one who proposed that the whole story should turn out to have been a dream. Johnson hated that idea, which he felt, as many people do, was a cheat, but Lang sided with Getz and always strongly defended the ending. He said that the audience would not accept the idea of three deaths and a man's life being ruined just because he made one mistake, which clearly undermines his own statement about the movie following logically the consequences of a moment off guard. I bring this up now because it is in this scene where Wanley is alone at the club that the transition happens, where he is going to fall asleep and dream, although the audience is not aware of that on first viewing. The fact that he is reading the Song of Songs, that is, classy erotic poetry, tells us where his thoughts are when he falls asleep. I myself basically think Nunnally Johnson was right, and that this would ultimately be a stronger film, and certainly a more uncompromising noir, if it had the original downbeat ending. However, a valid case can be made for the dream concept, which is that it makes the film not about a man trapped by circumstances or by fate, but about what lurks in a man's subconscious, going back to that casebook Freudianism in the opening scene. What it expresses is the idea of desire and fear being intimately connected, so that what starts as a fantasy becomes a nightmare because the man's guilt about even dreaming about sex with another woman makes him imagine terrible punishment. This scene, probably the most famous and one of the best in the film, echoes the previous one in which Wanley stood at the window, but now nighttime instead of daytime, dream instead of waking. Again, there's a wonderful use of reflections on the glass to suggest a boundary between the everyday and the dream world. 
and then this striking and unforgettable shot where the reflection of Joan Bennett appears beside her portrait, and then the camera pans to show us that, yes, she is really standing there. The doubling of the woman and the man's surprise again echo Laura, the scene where Jean Tierney appears as Dana Andrews is sitting under her portrait. This is one of the great female entrances in noir, complete with the black feathered hat and the sparkly black jacket, her knowing and amused expression, and then the terrific dialogue she has, where she reveals how self-aware she is about being the object of, shall we say, the male gaze. She makes fun of the viewers who try to appear as if they're seriously studying this work of art. There's kind of a funny in-joke here, since Robinson was in fact a noted art collector and connoisseur, and it's hard to imagine him admiring a kitschy picture like this. Alice pegs Wanley as falling somewhere between the solemn stare and the long, low whistle. Clearly not a wolf, but a guy who is open to being picked up. While she has his number, Wanley seems very naive, he says the portrait is you, sure, although the woman in the picture looks much softer and more innocent than this character proves long, to be. Low, and she says very skeptically, you know so quickly? You would think he well, would be better, skeptical better of the idea that this gorgeous young woman would pick up a mousy middle-aged man without ulterior motives. Like but then keep in mind that we are this. in his dream. Oh, no, no, it's not that exactly, but... Uh, and she is very appealing here, very obvious. disarming. I'm afraid you might misunderstand her. May I help you? Could you? I'm not married. I have no desire. The image of the woman in the window, the illustration of the film's title, has a number of resonances. It suggests the idea of a frame. It presents the woman as a kind of commodity, possibly for sale. It gestures towards the idea of voyeurism. Foster Hirsch has written, all noir temptresses have the remoteness of a painting scene in a window. And to embody their dreamlike otherness, the actresses who impersonate them perform in a cryptic manner, sleepwalking through masculine nightmares. At like this point, we're st still very much in male fantasy mode, drink, not yet into now. the nightmare. Show them to you. Note that the nightclub has vaguely classical good. decorations, and yeah, like the painting, like the Song of Songs, this That's represents amazing. erotic allure for the professor. Eleven? Here he admits that he is wary of no, the siren call of adventure, Don't and she makes fun should. of him for being what? afraid of her. I Though given warm. that she is wearing black gloves afraid. and a crow's wing hat and smoking oh, with a long cigarette that, holder, uh, presumably any sensible man would be afraid. Nunnally Johnson, incidentally, was lying. very upset when he I saw that Lang had given her this cigarette never, holder, which never, he saw, thought was a ridiculous anachronism evoking never. 1920s Europe, and he wrote, Oh my God, I forgot to write, she did not carry a two-foot cigarette holder. The idea of Alice inviting the professor over to her apartment to see her sketches is obviously meant to be a humorous play on the cliché of men trying to lure women in to see their etchings. Alice's apartment is the central setting for the rest of the film, and it's obviously designed with great care. The art director on the film was Duncan Kramer, but Lang was famous for his obsessive attention to the visual qualities of his films, for meticulously planning and then endlessly fussing over details of sets and props, so he surely had a lot of control over this as well. In the original novel, the character of Alice is much more of a common tart, but here she obviously has pretensions to class, with all the objets d'art, plants and flowers, modernist furniture, etched glass, these kind of interiors that are poised somewhere between elegance and vulgarity are typical of Hollywood in this period. The mirrors all over the walls will be amply used to create reflection shots, continuing the theme that was started in the scene with the portrait in the window. The nude sculpture on the mantel is another obvious hint as to Wanley's state of mind. Note how he looked at the statue and then looked at Alice retreating into the bedroom. You might wonder how a mere artist's model, which Alice apparently is, could afford such an apartment, which is something Wanley should maybe be thinking about, but isn't. Clemens, who did the one There's the a good question here about how innocent this nice encounter idea. is, or how much Wanley is to be blamed for what he's doing. On the one hand, they 
just seem to be chatting, and it's rather hard to imagine that anything else is going to transpire between these two, though given the ambiguity of Alice's motives, it's hard to say. But on the other hand, this is a man who just saw his wife and kids off to the country, telling his wife how much he was going to miss her, and a few hours later he's in a strange woman's apartment guzzling champagne at 1 a.m. I think we're supposed to think this is only a small transgression, a moment of carelessness, which is about to have much graver consequences. This is the moment when the dream becomes a nightmare, with the sudden arrival of this mysterious man who will be extremely ticked off to find another man in his mistress's apartment. Meanwhile, Wanley is busy opening another bottle of champagne, conveniently needing a pair of scissors and cutting his finger, both bits that prefigure future events. This is an extremely tightly constructed screenplay. The actor here is Arthur Loft in a very brief but memorable bit. This whole sequence is wonderfully constructed. Watch the rapid editing that conveys the sheer unexpectedness of it. He is dead, though miraculously with absolutely no blood despite being repeatedly stabbed with scissors. You have to love how she helpfully hands him those scissors. After that sudden burst of action and fast editing, now there is this moment of paralysis as they both come to terms with what's happened. A word about the editing since I just mentioned it. This film was the first credit for a woman named Marjorie Fowler who would go on to work prolifically in the 1950s and 60s, editing some major films like Elmer Gantry, and also a mid-50s television series called The New Adventures of China oh, no. Smith that starred none other than Dan Duryea. She oh, was the please. daughter of producer and screenwriter Nunnally Johnson, and was working as an assistant to her future husband, editor Gene Fowler Jr., who started working on The Woman in the Window but had to leave to go into the army. What was his name? Lang championed Marjorie to take over, though she shrewdly thought that this was because he figured with a neophyte he would be able to exert more control over the editing process. It's a little known fact that editing was one profession was? in studio era Hollywood in which many women reached the top. For instance, Barbara McLean, Zanuck's yeah. longtime top editor, who trained Marjorie Fowler. Ironically, but maybe not did. coincidentally, it was something did. of an invisible profession, Anything. since even more than with camera work, it's it arguably something the viewer is not supposed to notice if it's done well, and it gets subsumed into what people right. assume is the director's work. This is particularly the case with directors what? like Lang, who obsessively you? controlled every detail of There's their films the and were reluctant to give credit to collaborators. Lang was one of those directors who held, at least publicly, that the audience should never notice what the camera is doing, because that meant they're being taken out of the story. For the most part, the cinematography by Milton Krasner in this film avoids the kind of very dramatic angles or movements or extreme lighting that we associate with noir, but it has a wonderful silkiness and subtlety. Forget subtlety, though. Check out this bedroom, the satin coverlet, the giant cherub-bedecked mirror above the bed. This clearly tells us that this is what used to be known as a love nest, and that Alice is a kept woman. The idea that her sugar daddy is someone she hardly knew and had no connection with other than his visiting her a few times a week is a plot device. Wanley is now thinking, as he starts to call the police, that maybe they can get away with covering this up rather than confessing, which of course would mean his wife and his colleagues and friends finding out about his being in this woman's apartment. Nobody but the one line where Alice talks bitterly about how this man never took her out anywhere also suggests a little glimpse, one of the few we get, into who this woman really is and what her life is like, that despite the classy trappings, it really is very tawdry, and that she probably is very lonely, which explains why she goes out and prowls around the window with her portrait. Nobody. 
Alice is one of the most ambiguous of all femme fatales. Indeed, it's debatable whether she really qualifies as a femme fatale. Though she certainly has a destructive effect on Wanley's life, it's not really intentional. She's nowhere near the scheming, deceitful, cold-blooded kind of woman that Phyllis Dietrichson in Double Indemnity or Kathy Moffat in Out of the Past is. Do you think there's something there we can are do? often yeah, hints yeah. that Alice is selfish or opportunistic or not entirely trustworthy, but she never is, is never a deliberate no, destroyer of men, won't, just a rather confused and not all that wrong. bright no, woman so who is trying kind of to survive and who's chiefly Who learned to do that by They'll using her looks and her sex appeal on men. Joan Bennett is particularly right for this part because she had the ability to be simultaneously enigmatic with a sense that she's holding something back, no about and at the same time she always has a down-to-earth, common-sense quality. No she doesn't that. seem to get I'd too tied up in t- trying to delve into her character's idea. motivation, and she's but able to suggest several things at once. The way Alice can go from you seeming very was... self-assured and calculating to seeming in over her head and borderline hysterical, as she is in this scene. She can leave you guessing about whether she is a good egg or not, and you really could believe it either way. Bennett had tremendous range, going from innocent blonde ingenues to sassy working girls, to icy femme fatales, to bourgeois matrons, to intrepid heroines. She could do all these different things and never get typed as one thing, not because she lacked personality, but because she has that contained quality. She doesn't give too much away. She was proud to say that her father had always said, that Joan, she is full of possibilities. It was not only Johnson who cast Bennett in this part, though apparently she was not his first choice and he had considered Tallulah Bankhead, which would have made for a very different dynamic here. Bennett was friendly with Johnson's partner, Bill Getz, and she also had already worked with Lang on Manhunt, where she plays a very adorable, if not entirely convincing, cockney streetwalker. The relationship between Bennett and Lang is quite interesting, if also somewhat ambiguous. After The Woman in the Window, she brokered a partnership between Lang and her husband, producer Walter Wanger, to form Diana Productions, an independent unit at Universal which was named for Bennett's oldest daughter. Their first project was Scarlet Street, which reunited the director, the three stars, cinematographer, and other crew from Woman in the Window on a much darker film. Bennett would also star in Lang's The Secret Beyond the Door in 1947. Some friends of Lang's claimed he was having an affair with Bennett, who was married to Wanger from 1940 to 1965, and they had just had a daughter in 1943, shortly before the shooting of the woman in the window. Assuming she and Lang were romantically involved, Wanger was evidently unaware, or else chose to overlook it, which does not seem very likely given subsequent events. Bennett's life took a noir turn in 1951, when there was a huge scandal when Wanger shot Bennett's agent Jennings Lang, with whom he believed she was having an affair, and went briefly to jail. Bennett was actually present on the scene of the shooting, and she stood by her husband and spoke in his defense, though she also always insisted that she had never been unfaithful to him. Be that as it may, editor Jean Fowler, for instance, stated that Lang was in love with Bennett. Certainly he lavishes a lot of attention on her. She never looked more beautiful or was presented with more erotic power than in his films. Robinson recalled instances of Lang spending hours arranging the folds of her negligee to get exactly the shadow he wanted, and various people described him being extremely controlling of her performance here, directing every tilt of her head and gesture she makes, which does give a slightly stiff, marionette-like quality to her acting, which sort of works for this particular movie. She is, after all, a figure in a dream, but was not really her natural style. Although he obviously loved using her, Lang was reportedly quite dismissive of Bennett's acting talent and would make condescending remarks about her to others. Sadly, this was typical, since she tended to be very underrated. She was popular, but not really seen in her time as a serious actress on the level of Stanwyck or Davis. Actually, she's not only a marvelous presence in films like this, 
with fantastic delivery and humor and seductiveness, but she had dramatic depth that would come out in her best roles, like The Reckless Moment from 1949. She came from a famous acting dynasty. Her father Richard Bennett was a legendary matinee idol, and her older sister Constance was at one time the highest paid actress in Hollywood. Joan started acting as a 19-year-old divorcee with a child from an ill-fated teenage marriage, and when you see her in the early 30s, she is almost unrecognizable, blonde, her natural hair color, and baby-faced. She has great natural charm and appeal, but she does seem like an actress who has a light touch but is not terribly serious or ambitious about her work. In the late 1930s, however, she dyed her hair to dark brown, leading to lots of comments about her resemblance to Hedy Lamarr, and started making darker movies as well. The Woman in the Window and Scarlet Street were breakthrough films for Bennett, and still the roles she is best remembered like for. Car, yes, sir. At this point, the movie shifts for a time into an hey, almost Charlie. exclusive focus yeah. on suspense. In the previous right scene, Wanley and Alice Trying have to decided to gamble yeah. on disposing of the body. This begins a long sequence focused on the mechanics of covering up the crime and on Wanley's new hypersensitivity to threats of exposure. For instance, he wouldn't usually notice the garage man calling out his name, but now, as he hears the guy talk about another neighbor getting in late, he knows this is a potential witness against him, and there's even a heavy metaphor in the line where the garage man tells him to get his brakes realigned because they're loose. The scene where he's stopped by a cop because his headlights are out further drives home the fact that Wanley, previously a law-abiding citizen, is now terrified of the police, and we see them through his eyes as menacing and aggressive and unreasonably suspicious. There's a very pointed line in this scene where the cop asks his name and then says scornfully, What's that, Polish? And Wanley says, No, it's American. There's very little you could really call social critique or political subtext in this film, which interestingly makes absolutely no no reference to the war that was going on at the time. But this moment, especially aimed at a Jewish actor who within a few years would be attacked for his left-wing politics, is a little shot at the xenophobia of the American establishment. We also see that the cop is willing to let it go once he learns that Wanley is a professor, even though he meekly admits he's only an assistant professor, again showing the bias and arbitrariness of the law. It's hard to imagine the woman in the window with anyone but Edward G. Robinson playing the central role. That G stood for his original surname. He was born Emanuel Goldenberg in Romania in 1893, and Americanized, or Gentilized, his name when he started acting. The Edward G. was so that he could keep his original initials. The Robinson he apparently adopted somewhat at random, and later said he regretted because it made signing autographs a hassle. In his remarkably long career, he was in films for almost 50 years, from the 1920s through 1973, the year he died. 1944 was a banner year, since Robinson made this and Double Indemnity, in which he plays not the protagonist, but the investigator who is too close to solve the case. This was a moment at which he was starting to move away from, more often from the kind of hard-boiled gangster roles and snarling or brash, fast-talking tough guys that had made him a star. The character of Professor Richard Wanley is much closer to who he was off-screen, He was erudite, cultured, multilingual, an art lover, a passionate progressive. But he had this mug that was straight out of a Ouija crime scene, the mouth that seems designed for chomping on a cigar, the tiny eyes and the beetling brows. Obviously with his face and this squat build and the harsh nasal voice, he was never going to be a leading man. But early on, audiences loved him for his toughness and cockiness the little Caesar persona. But what's interesting about Robinson is that even in his tough guy roles like Rico Bandello, he brought an unusual degree of vulnerability and pathos, the pathos of being ugly, being rejected, being unloved, almost like the great movie monsters of the same period. He had tremendous range and wound up playing all different kinds of roles over the course of his career, 
But somehow a touchstone in many of his best performances is the experience of being betrayed and disillusioned. He was very good at playing characters who, for all their aggressiveness or their intellectual prowess, are curiously trusting and easily deluded, either about the people they love or about themselves. And when they realize this betrayal, they react either with murderous rage or with a kind of bewildered paralysis or some combination of the two. The complexity of Robinson's persona, his ability to be menacing, vulnerable, cerebral, tender, neurotic, sometimes all at the same time, made him perfect for film noir, which brought back the moral ambiguity of the pre-code era, the acceptance that good people can do bad things and bad people can still attract sympathy. This was more or less forbidden by the production code, but Noir was able to bring it in clandestinely by crafting stories that could follow the letter of the code while subverting its spirit. You could say that moral ambiguity in Noir was like bootleg booze during Prohibition, officially banned, but flowing freely, even if sometimes it's heavily adulterated. Robinson also had a great gift for conveying anxiety and a dense, knotted inner life. A lot of the woman in the window is simply about the experience of feeling hunted, which was a major theme in Fritz Lang's work. Of course, we almost always root for a person who is being hounded, Lang showed in M that we can even sympathize with a child murderer if his experience of being pursued and trapped is vividly presented. Hitchcock was probably even more obsessed with the man on the run theme, but in his case, the hunted men are usually innocent and wrongly accused and the focus is much more on simple suspense than on the feelings of people who have actually committed a crime. Wanley is a lot like Anne Baxter's character in Lang's The Blue Gardenia, in that both have killed in self-defense and really should be able to come forward, but their fear of not being believed, and in both cases, the shame of having been in a compromising position, having been where they shouldn't have been, means they try to cover up their involvement and thus suffer more than they might have if they had confessed. In this whole sequence, Wanley is trying to stay very calm and think his way out of this situation, talking about how they need to consider every detail, drawing on his knowledge of police work, taking charge and telling Alice what to do. Their relationship is quite interesting in that they are essentially strangers. They're not lovers and didn't plan to commit this crime together, yet they're now bound together and forced to trust one another, and they play this intensity very well. While there are repeated hints that at least on Alice's side, she is not entirely trusting or trustworthy. But in this scene, they're working together because they have a common cause. There is a long wordless sequence here, done purely with visuals and lighting, the wonderful inky shadows, the rain, the suspense of trying to get the body out of the apartment, the inopportune arrival of that strangely suspicious seeming man. It's a kind of noir ballet or shadow play. Lang was one of those filmmakers who started in the silent era who never fully lost that style. When you think of his films, you don't tend to think about the dialogue, certainly not the way you do with Billy Wilder, say, or Otto Preminger, some of his fellow Viennese directors. Instead, it's sequences like this that are purely visual and are about mood and some very basic but intense emotion, in this case, fear. There's a certain relentlessness and obsessiveness about Lang's films. Their touch is never light, but it is lasting. And there is a moment of tenderness when these two part, thinking that they may never see each other again. Thank you. And there are very mixed feelings, expressed not in words, but just in the way Bennett and Robinson play it, with a sense of sadness, perhaps because they know they'll never be the same again, perhaps because they've formed a connection that has to be broken. Lovely shot here of her again as the woman in the window, with the reflection harking back to her first appearance. 
The wonderful framing of much of this scene through the doorway, the images distorting in the rain, and here she is again in the frame. Wanley's trip into Westchester to dump the body is another long, largely wordless sequence with a mixture of macabre atmosphere and, as we'll see, a number of humorous moments, that kind of humor that comes from extreme tension. So while Wanley carries out this errand, let's talk a little more about Edward G. Robinson. Though this film seems to have no connection to the war, during this period, he was very involved in the fight against Nazism and fascism. What was it, he was involved with early efforts to combat Nazi Germany and tried to enlist in the military when the war broke out, though he was turned away because of his age. He worked for the Office of War Information, making radio broadcasts in some of the many languages he spoke, which included Yiddish, Romanian, and German. He entertained troops and war workers, as well as donating, donating a great deal of money to war relief efforts in the USO. Appropriately enough, in 1939 he played an FBI agent in Confessions of a Nazi Spy, one of the very few pre-war films to sound the alarm about what was happening in Germany. And in 1946 he would be cast as a Nazi hunter in Orson Welles' The Stranger, the first Hollywood feature to include footage of the concentration camps. He also appeared in the 1948 film adaptation of All My Sons, Arthur Miller's Assault on War Profiteers, and the same year in John Huston's Key Largo, a parable about fascism where he plays a dictatorial gangster. During the post-war years, he was a great supporter of civil rights for African Americans and other democratic causes. The mid to late 40s were his heyday, as he was free of his Warner Brothers contract and able to work at different studios, taking mostly excellent roles. But as with many other actors, what was considered patriotic during World War II became suspect during the Cold War, and Robinson was called to testify before the House Committee on Un-American Activities because of his longtime support for progressive causes. His case is particularly painful because although he was not blacklisted, he was humiliated by HUAC, forced to grovel, name names, declare that he'd been duped and used, and they cruelly labeled him a very choice sucker for having been taken in, so they claimed, by communist front organizations. Note the sign in this scene that says, no parking, picnicking, bicycling, walking along drive, but it doesn't say no disposing of dead bodies. And speaking of dead bodies, Arthur Loft makes an excellent corpse here. The fact that his eyes remain open makes him seem so much more convincingly dead than movie corpses usually do. And the fact that he is significantly larger than poor Eddie Robinson adds an element of grotesque comedy as he's trying to figure out how to carry him. Back to more serious subjects, though, we might note the irony that the Goldenberg family came to America because one of Emmanuel's brothers was attacked by an anti-Semitic mob, but he, as Edward G. Robinson, fell afoul of what was unquestionably an anti-Semitic movement. For several years after his testimony, he was gray-listed, that is, not banned from working in Hollywood, but treated as persona non grata, and during this time he toiled in B pictures, some of which, like Hugo Freganese's Black Tuesday, are actually excellent. He owed his rehabilitation to arch-conservative Cecil B. DeMille, who cast him in the Ten Commandments in 1956, for which he was grateful. He went on working until very shortly before his death. Notoriously and incredibly, he was never even nominated for an Academy Award, despite being widely recognized as a great actor. As he was dying of cancer, the Academy evidently said, oops, and bestowed an honorary Oscar on him, which fortunately he did learn about, though he died before the ceremony and the award was collected by his widow. Robinson was not only intensely serious, but intensely conscientious about acting. He said, to be entrusted with a character was always a big responsibility to me, and also that, to my mind, the actor has this great responsibility of playing another human being. It's like taking on another person's life, and you have to do it sincerely and honestly as you can. 
This is quite different from the method style that would start to enter films at the end of the 1940s, which was much more focused on the actor drawing on his or her own experience, so that arguably instead of becoming the character, each character becomes them. Robinson, on the other hand, sees himself portraying another person's story and adhering to that truth, which may explain why he was able to play such extremely different characters. And even when he's playing a role closer to his real personality, like Wanley, he's totally committed to following the story and the character where it goes. It's a type of acting with very little vanity or self-indulgence. Fritz Lang was not what you would call an actor's director, to put it mildly. He seems to have had very little sympathy for them or feeling for their craft. He was known for treating his actors like puppets, giving them very exact instructions and even adjusting their positions with his hands. Like Hitchcock, he wasn't interested in their interiority and just wanted them to adhere exactly to his vision for each frame. He would cover the floor with tape markings for their movements. Marlena Dietrich complained that he would map these out from his own steps, and since his stride was longer than hers, it was impossible for her to follow the marks naturally. He was notoriously abusive towards some actors and crew members. Like other legendarily tyrannical directors like Mark LaCurtiz, he would treat big stars like Edward G. Robinson respectfully, knowing he couldn't get away with mistreating them, but he would be harder on supporting actors or those like Bennett, whom he saw as more insecure, that, uh, and on crew members. Uh, promoter, In this film, apparently, he was especially uh, cruel to Edmund uh, Briand, uh, an elderly English character World actor who is playing Wanley's he's friend Dr. Promoter. Barkston here. Also, I like Curtiz, Lang was accused of putting his actors in to... physical danger with little regard for their <clears throat> safety. Bennett, for instance, said she barely not escaped not from a burning house scene in Secret Beyond the Door. With today's focus on abusive power by men in Hollywood, people tend to look back at the old days and assume that everyone just accepted this kind of behavior from directors. But that's not really true. It may have been tolerated, but certainly people noticed and objected to it, and some individually stood up to it. Nunnally Johnson said the whole crew hated Lang's guts, and that people found it especially painful to see him yell at poor Edmund Brion, who was in a delicate health. There are also many stories of big stars like Robinson, Cagney, and Bogart confronting directors like Lang and Curtiz and telling them to cut out this kind of abuse because they had the clout to actually make trouble with the studios. So Lang's sets were never particularly happy, though people still wanted to work with him because they respected his genius as a filmmaker. And the three leads on this film all were fairly comfortable with Lang and genuinely admired him. Robinson, at least, had a very good attitude towards the less pleasant parts of movie making. He said, The sitting around on the set is awful, but I always figure that's what they pay me for. The acting I do for free. You bet. In this scene, we've seen Wanley trying to navigate being with his friends as they discuss the disappearance of Claude Mazard, the man he killed. From this point, the movie starts alternating between scenes where he is under the strain of trying to keep up appearances of normality and hide his secret, and largely wordless scenes where he is either alone, as he is here, burning Mazard's hat in a rather unlikely summertime hearth fire, or speaking with Alice, with whom he's able to talk openly about the killing. As his public interactions become more and more fraught with anxiety and tension, we also see an increasing despondency and defeatism when he's alone. For heightened contrast, his melancholy here, as he's writing to his wife about how lonely he is, is counterpointed by a satirical radio commercial for Castolo Rex, which promises to treat that tired feeling and the problems of upset well, digestion. Not only does the film continue to insert comedy to vary the tone, but there's this undertone of mockery aimed at mainstream 40s culture and its crassness, which is contrasted with Wanley's study, filled with books, landscape paintings, classical statuary. 
Mazard, who we've just learned was the fabulously wealthy head of World Enterprises Incorporated, is very much a represent representative of that crass outer world. This dynamic also makes sense when we think of this story as being an expression of Wanley's own, perhaps repressed feelings, not just desire and the attendant fear, but perhaps a sense of resentment about the fact that he, who is obviously so well-educated and cultivated, is toiling as a humble assistant professor, while a thuggish promoter like Mazard is raking in the millions and able to possess a woman like Alice. So in his dream, Wanley sees himself as pitted against this other realm. Everything that we continue to learn about Mazard makes it seem like the world is well rid of him, so we're never given any reason to think about his death as anything other than a misfortune for Wanley. Indeed, in this scene, the finding of his body is an excuse for outright comedy. I was practicing woodcraft in the woods just off the Bronx River Parkway extension when I found Mr. Mr. Mazza's remains. No, I was not scared. A boy scout is never scared. If I get the reward, I will send my younger brother to some good college and I will go to Harvard. Newsreels came in for a great deal of mockery in films of this period. This Another thing that was extremely prevalent in this time well, exactly was the police procedural. Evidently, so audiences could not get enough of hearing about instance, the latest police methods, or at least filmmakers thought else, they couldn't. This the film is a variant you know on the form. The First of all, we don't actually car. see the police at work, for the most part. No scenes of people peering into microscopes, looking at bullets or threads. Instead, we hear about it from the DA in this scene, who is holding forth and showing off how much the police much already know from Wanley's tire tracks, no, shoe prints, not. coat fabric, etc. More importantly, we're not on the side the of the police here, but on the side of the criminal, checkpoint. who's being forced to listen Especially to all this, prints. seeing his own friend closing in on him. How's that? The casting of Raymond Massey well, the as the DA is perfect, the boxers, since well he was great at playing characters who are shoe, ostensibly good guys, indeed, way, often right, overbearingly right, virtuous right, authority right, figures, man. but who are subtly unsympathetic and even yes. scary. The man weighs in the it's the voice mainly. Response. He has the Where's voice of a prosecutor with a, a ringing, circuit. accusatory You're tone. And time. even when no. he's trying to seem affable, as in this film, there's something so zealously puritanical and hard-driving like about him. In fact, though Massey was born checks. and raised in Canada, his family won't. did descend you from original Massachusetts yes. settlers, so we guess he came by his puritanism honestly. He was famous for playing Lincoln, of course. He once said he was the only actor to be typecast as a president. Since he played Lincoln in a number of films, and he also played John Brown twice, and Sherlock Holmes in an early sound film. But that darker side would be perfectly exploited in East of Eden, where he plays James Dean's father who refuses him love or acceptance. A fascinating piece of trivia about Massey, his acrimonious divorce from his second wife Adrian Allen, with whom he fathered actress Anna Massey, became the inspiration for the Tracy and Hepburn film Adam's Rib, written by Ruth Gordon and Garson Kanan. Massey and Allen were represented in court by lawyers who were married to each other, William and Dorothy Whitney, and subsequently Massey married Dorothy Whitney, while his ex-wife married William Whitney. Truth, in other words, is stranger than fiction. Back to this particular role. On the surface, it's similar to Robinson's role in Double Indemnity, an eager bloodhound who has no idea that the criminal he's pursuing is in fact his friend. Here, however, he never does find that out, and there is none of the pathos of Robinson's portrayal of the investigator who is blinded by his love for the guilty man and greatly saddened when he does uncover the truth. I think we feel yes, that Layler would not show Wanley any pity if William, he did know the truth. Well, His Layla. line at the end of this scene about how the law himself. operates to Bang. nail a man yeah. is delivered with gleeful callousness that makes him clearly the enemy. I'll join you in a minute. 
Throughout all these scenes where Wanley is with the DA, he's constantly making mistakes that reveal his knowledge of the case, which the keen-eyed Layla always spots. These blunders can seem excessive. You keep thinking, can't an intelligent man like the professor do a better job of playing dumb about this? There are two ways to interpret his behavior. One, that the sheer anxiety of trying to hide the truth makes him keep blurting it out. Nunnally Johnson noted that Lang was drawn to an old, probably apocryphal anecdote about a man who went to visit the elderly J. Pierpont Morgan and was warned in advance to be careful not to stare at his nose, since Morgan had a huge, red, pitted nose which he was extremely sensitive about. And the poor man was so anxious not to make this blunder that he, when he was introduced, he said, something like, nice to meet you, Mr. Nose. Lang evidently wanted to play up this kind of thing, whereas Johnson felt they were maybe going too far and becoming unbelievable or corny. It's also possible, looking at this whole story as framed by Freud, to see these as Freudian slips that reveal Wanley's actual desire to be caught, either because of his sense of guilt or because the suspense is so great that it would simply be a relief to have it over with. He starts to use a ploy of pointing out all the evidence against him, showing Layla the scratch on his arm just after they've been talking about how the murderer scratched himself on the barbed wire. Later in the next scene, he'll go even further in presenting himself as the suspect. Presumably, this is a gambit to deflect suspicion, on the assumption that if he were really guilty, he would try to hide these things, and also to point up how absurd it would seem for him, a soft-spoken professor with no apparent connection to the dead man, to be the murderer. But again, this could be a subconscious attempt to confess, a way of telling the truth while having it be taken as a joke. Probably with a pair of scissors. Continuing this script's habit of foreshadowing or placing panic, very deliberate clues to what's going to happen, this scene also includes the doctor prescribing Wanley now, some pills that people. conveniently this not man, only kill if taken in large sick, enough quantity but easy, leave no trace. Also the first mention of Mazard's bodyguard, who has disappeared, and the fact that he may be preparing to blackmail the guilty couple. And there is Layla's speech about how this couple, whom he assumes to be lovers, are now hating and fearing each other, each waiting for the other to be caught and give them away. Again, recalling double indemnity and the idea that once people commit murder, they are stuck with each other till the end of the line. Layla, in addition to his other unpleasant quantities, has a pronounced streak of misogyny. In a subsequent scene, he has a rather laughable line referring to a woman know, who has been picked up on well. suspicion of being Mazard's girlfriend. She's got mm-hmm. something on her conscience, but, but what woman so. hasn't? hasn't it's up? hard to say if this kind of casual oh, sexism is being deliberately exposed and mocked, or if the movie is just taking it for granted, or even or agreeing with it. It's of a piece with the ambiguity about Alice, who is by no means evil, it is obviously presented as because trouble. He's he's a, known crook with a, a lot has been written about, written about the idea that the femme fatale character, who is chiefly a feature of noir in the 1940s, much less so in the 50s, was an expression of men's anxiety about women working during World War II, thus leading to films that demonize strong, independent women. I always point out that this makes no sense, because first of all, femme fatales are never women who work. The whole point is that they are women who use men and exploit the most traditional feminine wiles, using their sexual power and also appealing to male chivalry by presenting themselves as weak and in need of protectors. In this sense, Alice, the kept woman, is very much a typical femme fatale. And we see through the attitudes of these men that what's really at issue is not at all a fear of women being liberated or independent, but an age-old fear of women as temptresses. This is quite an adventure for me. This whole sequence now, in which Wanley is unhappily dragged off to visit the scene where the body was found, is remarkably sadistic, almost a kind of torture by irony. And Robinson beautifully plays the incredible strain Wanley is under and how he starts to crack under it. Not only is he forced to relive what was surely the worst night of his life under the watchful eye of the DA, but now he is also under the eye of the head of homicide, Jackson, 
played incidentally by an actor named line. Thomas E. Jackson, who had appeared also as a cop uh, in Little Caesar in 1931. Oh, yes. He was a How's New York coming? native, right, chiefly nothing. notable for this wonderful husky, heavily accented did? voice he has. Uh, uh, he almost sounds like William Demarest and has a similar bulldog what quality. The sadism of this scene, which is observed very <laughs> impersonally, with no camera effects stupidity. to heighten the sense of yeah. Wanley's torment, is typical of Lang, who can seem to treat his characters almost as cruelly and coldly as he treated his actors. Lang is one of the central creators of film noir, one of the directors who did the most to develop the noir ethos. That was only one of his many accomplishments, but the one that concerns us most here, since The Woman in the Window is perhaps his first true noir, though he's been making films that can be considered proto-noir ever since the silent era. Fritz Lang was born in Vienna in 1890. The fact that such an inordinate number of great film directors came out of Austria, Eric Inspector? von Stroheim, morning, Ernst Lubitsch, you Billy know, Wilder, Lino, Otto Preminger, the list Mr. goes Lino, on, you, and it can seem that those who didn't Wanley, come from Austria right. came Captain from Hungary, it reflects you, the extraordinary he cultural he fertility of fantasy well, Vienna first, and then the then areas we'll within its Lord orbit. Inspector. Lang was clearly influenced by having absorbed the ideas of Freud and Nietzsche, but his first love was painting, Significant now, in connection with this film and also his the next, Jackson, Scarlet course, Street, where Robinson plays a Sunday painter. Lang went to art school, 15, both in Vienna and later miles. in Paris, Standard in the era of the Vienna Secession, the, the movement of artists like Klimt and Egon Schiele like and Oskar Kokoschka, who would later be declared degenerate by the Nazis. Lang's father, who was a wealthy manager of a construction company, disapproved of painting as a career. So after serving in World War I, during which he saw a lot of action and suffered injuries and shell shock, he went to Germany and joined the thriving film industry. He started as a writer and directed his first films in 1919. Just a few years later, he made his first major work, Destiny, the title of which actually translates wonderfully to well, The Weary Death, and a hugely influential Dr. Mabuza the Gambler, right, a crime thriller about an evil, you omnipotent supercriminal. His early works are tremendously ambitious. Metropolis in 1927 is one of the great icons of cinema, but it actually drove the studio, UFA, to bankruptcy because it failed to recover its enormous cost. Something notable about Lang's there. silent films, which would Not really reflect on the remainder of his scene, career, is his tendency to, to work in mind. genres, like the spy thriller. He more or less invented the science fiction genre with Metropolis and Woman in the Moon. And to use these popular forms, which are full of action and sensational settings, to tackle intellectual concepts. His major collaborator in the yes, 1920s was his going. wife, screenwriter Thea von Harbo, well, who co-wrote almost yes, all of his German of films. I suppose so. The great turning point in his career came with M in 1931, well, I, I a film the whose importance in cinema history is hard to overstate. But from the perspective of, of Lang's career, Stuart. it was a turning well, away from me, the I, fantasy and spectacle that dominated his silent films and that tended to overpower actors who rarely contribute very much, well, a turning towards a gritty a realism so and a much more but intimate focus on the inner life of the characters. M is unimaginable without the Patience. devastating performance of Peter Lorre, so. and none of Lang's previous films Why depended on actors to that extent, if at all. As a portrait What's of a serial for? killer, tortured by compulsions he can't control, oh, M has influenced morning, countless so films dealing with psychological aspects of homicide, Very to draw on Wanley's lecture. Right. Because of the way we're forced to Just experience the feelings of this do, killer, <laughs> as well as for the rich and sordid depiction me, of the criminal underworld, M is maybe the most important of all proto-noir films. In 1933, no, Lang claimed that he was offered by Goebbels the chance to head a Nazi-run national film studio. Hitler had adored his film version of the Nibelungen saga, and that he resolved immediately to leave Germany, in part because his mother had Jewish heritage, although she was a practicing Catholic. There's been fierce controversy over the truth of this tale, and the circumstances under which he chose to leave, 
since Lang was known as a shaper of his own myth. In any event, Lang divorced von Harbo, who became a Nazi sympathizer, and left Germany, stopping off briefly in France before arriving in Hollywood in the mid-1930s. His first American films were a trio of stunning crime dramas, all featuring Sylvia Sidney, which moved from the Depression-era realism and fury through the poetic, romantic tragedy of You Only Live Once to a stylized Brecht and Vile musical in You and Me. The first two films pack an intense emotional punch with the performances of Spencer Tracy and Henry Fonda as men warped by their rage at being victims of social injustice. He then had a bit of a career lull during which he made a series of westerns and wartime thrillers which are entertaining but less powerful. Lang, like many people from the German-speaking world, was a great lover of the American West, so his westerns are by no means the outliers in his filmography that you might think. The Woman in the Window was a, his return to form. He would make at least ten more noir films. Only Robert Siodmak perhaps matches or excels his contribution to the noir canon. Well, Those contributions range from we the gothic, go. dreamlike Secret pleasure. Beyond the Hopefully Door and The House by the shoot. River, to the very hard-boiled and brutal The Big Heat, to the overheated but deeply felt clash by night, to the cold, gray, stripped-down parables of his last American films, While the City Sleeps and Beyond a Reasonable Doubt. At first glance, Lang and his oeuvre can seem fairly easy to define, Woman? the monocled Teutonic tyrant, the master of darkness. No. But there are actually many paradoxes surrounding this man it's who had attracted lurid rumors, for instance, that he had murdered his first wife, uh, but well, also evidently like had a more sensitive side, and whose films have probably. often been accused of being cold and detached from their characters, but which know. have moments she of explosive emotion, and also, whatever his that, relationship sure. with actors or attitude towards them, some very moving and involving uh, performances. Bottom of the barrel. Lang spoke late in his life about the way he had moved from anyway. a focus in his early silent films on extraordinary and archetypal figures like Dr. Mabuza, Siegfried, Death, or the killer Hans Beckert, to focusing on average Joe characters when he came to America. Characters like Wanley, who are not in control but are overwhelmed by circumstances. They are little men who are pitted against a society that is uncaring, corrupt, and unforgiving of failures. Though Lang is one editions? of the emigre directors most credited with bringing the style oh, of German expressionism to Hollywood, we see a bit of it here with the lighting on Robinson's face as he kneels by the fire, he was able to make films that mean? feel completely American, Listen. if not perhaps the vision of our country that Americans might prefer. He had a feeling for a certain Gotham cheapness College. and vulgarity. Yes, the increasing Dr. visual Wanley, barrenness of his films psychology. reflects a society that, by oh, the 1950s, oh, seems I, both morally and aesthetically bankrupt. Did We're I not say? there yet in this film. The look yes. here is still quite lush. Yes, uh, There's almost a parody of a civilized right? world the ivy-covered university, the English-style gentleman's you, uh, club, the art gallery, Wanley's study, which ref represent a kind no. of European old-world so holdover. I'm not worrying now. But now, as Alice I'm is sure very unwisely it. saying that she feels Aren't sure you? they are in the clear and have nothing to worry about, her I'm world sure. and Wanley's are about and to be I'm invaded to by the believe. ultimate representative of that Gorgeous, American crassness right. and sleaze that I'm I referred to earlier. Good night, thank you. Good night. It's always a surprise to me when I revisit this film to realize that Dan yes. Durier is fifth build and that he this actually does not appear up. until a full hour into the film. Because he makes such an impression and because he would play a larger role in Scarlet Street, I think of him as the third co-star. Though really he just has a couple of scenes, though they are long ones and knockouts. When he made this film, Durier was not yet a big star. This was his breakthrough performance. So when he is introduced Listen, first through his voice the over the intercom, it I'm may not have had the effect on audiences sound. at the time that it has today me. for noir fans, for whom this is I'm one of the, the most police. distinctive of all film voices, up there with Peter Lorre's. 
a light, slightly nasal tenor that always sounds like he's insinuating something, except when he's sneering at something. Many of us are moved to cheer when we hear it. Duryea's entrance here as the bodyguard height defined what would become his image, the bow tie, the straw hat, the slouching lazy posture, the smirk, the getup gives him this hucksterish quality. Well, He's not the type of, saying, of tough guy who sure. wears a fedora and a trench coat and carries a gat and lurks in alleys. Another He's the guy who wears a boater and slaps women around in bedrooms. The, the hat is an important message. touch, since it connects it the bodyguard to his employer, Mazard, who wore the same kind of straw boater, as does Layler, the DA. And this is notable since months. boaters are not and really something you associate with the 40s, more with the 20s, so it's hard to believe this was accidental. The hat has been frequently foregrounded. We saw it falling off Mazard's head as he strangled Lonely, left behind in the car, burned in the fireplace. The use of hats is typical of Lang's focus on objects. Even the scenes of men checking and retrieving their hats will turn out to have an unexpected significance. I know nothing whatever about the death of the hat, which he rudely fails to take off indoors, goes perfectly with Duryea's performance here. What makes him so menacing is not a typical hard-boiled demeanor, but his overconfidence and obnoxious insouciance. The very way he's so relaxed makes him more threatening. There's also something insulting about it. Look at the way he takes over her space, physically taunting her with her own impotence, making a big show of invading her home. The way he pokes in her drawers and fingers her personal belongings, later even her stockings and her perfume, is clearly an unspoken sexual threat and a way of making her feel helpless and defensive, as she obviously does here. Interestingly, she doesn't know how to handle him, and it takes her a long time to try to stand up to him, and even longer to try and use her feminine wiles on him. His trump card is that he was watching this place on the night Mazard was killed, but he doesn't have any hard evidence to prove who killed him, and we already know that he's a crook and have heard Layler say that he won't go to the police because he's hot, wanted on several raps. So in a way he's bluffing, as Alice ought to realize when he demands only $5,000, even though there's a reward of 10000 for information. But she is also bluffing, as he points out, since if she had nothing to fear she would have called the police the minute he entered. This man obviously comes from an underworld that we never see in the film, and invades this classier realm. Duryea kicks the film to another level, from being a murder mystery somewhat more in the mode of the 1930s to being a full-fledged noir. His presence in the film is to the credit of Lang, who had liked Duryea's work on his previous film, Ministry of Fear, clean, where he played huh? a sinister tailor who Pretty toys with a large pair of shears, and he wanted to cast him even though the character was written as an older man. Indeed, Lang thought it was a mistake to have all the major yes, male characters be old and wanted to add a younger anyway. actor. This film set the template for Duryea as a star, who was known as Hollywood's foremost manhandler of the fair sex. Off-screen Duryea was totally unlike the characters he was best known for playing. Famously, he was a family man, with one of the most stable and happy marriages in Hollywood. He led a quiet life, enjoyed gardening, served on the PTA at his children's school and was even a scout leader of the local Boy Scout troop. He came from a comfortable Could background be, you know. in White Plains, graduated from stairs. Cornell University, and worked for a time as an advertising executive because his parents disapproved of his desire to become an actor and convinced him to go into a more lucrative career. It was also a very stressful career, however, and in 1934, still in his 20s, he had a heart attack and was urged to find some work that wouldn't be so high pressure, and this led him back to his first love, the theater. After some early struggles, he became successful on Broadway in the 1930s and came to Hollywood in 1940 to appear in William Wyler's film adaptation of The Little Foxes, which he'd played on stage. His role is a supporting one, 
and a character who is a sniveling weasel despised by all the other characters. But whenever he is on screen, you can't take your eyes off him. There's something about his voice, the way he moves, the level of intensity and imagination he brings to his performances that makes him like a snake, hypnotic. He played a number of other small roles in the early 1940s, and The Woman in the Window was probably his best role up to this point in Hollywood, and it launched his great run in noir. Scarlet Street, Black Angel, Criss Cross, Too Late for Tears, The Underworld Story, The Burglar. Duryea claimed that he chose to go the route of being the meanest SOB in the movies, even though it was strictly against his mild, peace-loving nature, because he knew that he didn't have the looks or physique to be a leading man. So he needed to establish himself as a different type, and he managed to create a niche for himself as a kind of cross between a star and a character actor. He was never a leading man exactly, yet he had the charisma and the box office appeal of a star. He was extremely popular in this period, especially, funnily enough, with women. The studios would always advertise his films with images of him belting his female co-stars and taglines promising he would dish out more rough treatment, because this is what he was known and loved for. Interestingly, though he didn't come from the method generation, he told Hedda Hopper that in order to overcome his even temper and play these nasty, violent characters, he used experiences from his past, thinking of people he'd hated, especially drawing on his time in the advertising world and the pompous know-it-alls he had to please. It was really important to him to get inside his characters, to think their thoughts and feel their feelings, and then just let himself go being evil and despicable. Unlike Robert Ryan or Richard Widmark, who got very tired of being typecast as villains and found it a strain, Duryea seems to have made this strange double life work, though he did admit that he tried to keep his sons from seeing his movies and was troubled when other kids would tell them their daddy was a bad man. Of course, what makes Duryea so distinctive and so much fun to watch is that he's not the run-of-the-mill tough see, guy. He brings a lot of humor and, and a perverse kind Otherwise of charm. He's me, not really a character you love to clear, hate, but a character you love in. in spite of feeling that, that you maybe should hate him. So you gotta look you can see, way, see both how much he is enjoying up. playing I this heel and how much his character enjoys okay. being a heel. Take and Notice these Take great over. mirror shots at the end of this scene, with Duryea and Bennett both doubled, and be so that we see them from the front and the back, echoing some of the framing Thanks. of Wanley in the apartment in his earlier don't scenes. Don't try to run away or pull any tricks like that, because I'll be keeping an eye on things pretty close. Good night, and don't fret. You get the money, and that'll be the end of the whole thing. and then his exit being filmed only in the mirror. It's been argued by the critic Eileen McGarry that the central theme in The Woman in the Window is the doppelganger. The film is full of doubled images, starting with the portrait in the window and all the reflections in mirrors or windows, as well as recurring images like the straw hats. All these images suggest the possibility that people have two faces or two sides, and the difficulty of telling the false Something from happened. the true, or the good I've from the bad. Right Wanley has been dealing with the stress of leading a double life, trying to maintain his previous routine Your and pencil. character, while also being a criminal in constant fear of getting caught. Notice the way they are being shot sure through the iron that. bars of the park fence here, something. another of the favorite oh, well, noir motifs suggesting the threat of being behind bars, angry? which they are now facing. This scene is pivotal in that Wanley takes a step even further out of his apparent character. His first step was going to the nightclub and then home with Alice. His second step was deciding to hide the body instead of telling the truth to the police. And now, as he and Alice confront the blackmail demand, he unexpectedly suggests that they kill Height. So he is now not just guilty of covering up a justified manslaughter, but willing to be guilty of premeditated murder. In this scene, Wanley is suddenly much less anxious. He has a kind of fatalistic calm and proves to be much more wised up than Alice in his understanding of the options they have.
You can pay him and pay him and pay him until you're penniless. You get the sense or that at this point he has perhaps given up hope and resigned himself to ruin. Yet there's just the, the possibility also that he is secretly enjoying or the chance to play with crime. You can kill Putting the plan in motion, Wanley goes to the pharmacy to fill the prescription the doctor gave him. The pharmacist here is played by one of those ubiquitous character mm -hmm. actors who always makes you go, oh, that guy. Who's this guy off? is Harry Hayden, a character actor best powders. known for appearing in a number of yes, Preston Sturgis so. films, but he also turned up in a lot of noirs, The Blue Dahlia, The Killers, Out of the Past, Gun Crazy. He always has the little glasses that hide his eyes and a dead voice to go with his deadpan expression. He's like this crushed husk of a man who's been drained of all hope and is carrying on a meaningless existence, and he floats from film to film injecting these fleeting portraits of failure disguised as average work. American success. Yeah, children, you better not leave that laying around loose. I won't. The expressionist style that was so important to film noir means that outward appearances express what is going on internally. So, for instance, when people are plotting a murder, they should be doing it in a dark alley or a hotel room that's lit by a blinking neon sign. But noir films often did the opposite, too, like the scene in Double Indemnity where the murderous couple meet in a supermarket, or this scene where Wanley and Alice pl discuss their scheme to get rid of the blackmailer. In this sunlit marble corridor of a prosperous-looking office building, Matthew Thrift, writing for the BFI, calls the woman in the window a film noir about film noir, an endlessly witty and suspenseful exer exercise in genre deconstruction. This is an interesting take, given that this was one of the first fully realized noirs made at a time before anyone was aware that there was a style or a genre to deconstruct. This is basically the template for what many people consider to be the basic, quintessential noir story, that of an ordinary, decent man who, because he is taken in by the sexual allure of a dishonest woman, is plunged into a nightmare of violence and moral collapse. The fact that it is couched as a dream, though of course on first viewing the audience does not know that yet, makes it seem like a commentary on this very archetypal situation. Also, while it's not a parody of the hard-boiled style, of a kind that seemed to start almost as early as the style itself, but it is about people who seem to be using their knowledge of crime and detection, no doubt drawn from books or movies, as a guide when they find themselves sucked into a murder mystery. In this scene, Wanley is coaching Alice on how to poison height, and they keep coming back to the question of whether she will have the nerve to go through with it, so much of this movie is about the relationship between reality and fantasy, between the conscious and the subconscious, the dreaming mind and the waking mind, ultimately between the movie screen, which is evoked by all the mirrors and windows and reflections, and the world outside it. The connection between movies and dreams was long established by this point. Hollywood as the dream factory, dreaming represented as entering the movie screen. The idea of reality being like a movie became a 20th century cliché because everyone understood exactly what that meant, and there are so many Golden Age Hollywood movies that seem, in a sense, to be about their own moviness. Wanley's dream is the movie, so we see the way the conventions of a murder story have penetrated into his subconscious and he can cast himself as a crafty killer. Though the blackmailer, as we'll see, will accuse Alice and Wanley of being amateurs, as though they were staging a community theater production. And we see her dressed for the part here, in a sparkly, negligee-like evening gown. She is obviously planning now to use the best arrow in her quiver. This is probably Joan Bennett's best scene in the movie, since she gets to play a whole lot of different, layered effects. This will be a That's duel me. of wits between yeah. Alice and Hyde, as she tries Open to up. get him off guard, so to speak, so she can slip him the poison. She gets to play calculated seductiveness and barely concealed anxiety, 
and most interestingly a sense that she is just possibly open to switching her allegiance since height. I love how he tosses his hat aside here, drawing attention to it again. Seems now to be the smartest as well as the toughest man in the movie. And there is another dynamic between them in this scene. Studio publicity machines dubbed Duryea the heel with sex appeal. And he does have a kind of attractiveness. It's no accident that throughout much of this scene, the bed is visible, often just behind Joan Bennett with her nighty spread out on it. No. Bennett and Duryea's great chemistry would be exploited even more in their next film, Scarlet Street. She's a good partner for him because she has enough strength that she can spar with him. You're not just watching him bully someone who is defenseless, but she's also convincingly weak enough to crumble at the right moment and to convey, at least in Scarlet Street, a woman who might enjoy his rough treatment. These films with Lang greatly elevated Bennett's standing. In the late 1940s, she went on to work with other great European directors like Max Ophuls in The Reckless Moment, Jean Renoir in Woman on the Beach, both mature, challenging, complex roles, as well as making the terrific B noir The Scar with Paul Henry. But while playing bad women on screen was very good for her career, the scandal over Jennings Lang almost destroyed it. After the shooting, Wanger announced that he had been defending himself against an attempt to break up his home. He only served four months in jail, and he was embraced by the film industry when he got out and immediately went back to work, whereas Joan was more or less blacklisted and made very few films in the 1950s. That a possibly no. adulterous woman was treated no. more harshly than a man who was guilty of attempted murder is typical of You're Hollywood and of the kind you know of sexist that. standards right. that influence film noir well, dynamics. Fortunately, it. Bennett was able to keep working on stage and television and eventually starred in the cult TV show like Dark one? Shadows, which makes that? a very appropriate happy song. ending. Make it too. There is some great dialogue and interplay coming up in this scene. So let's watch it for a while. He obviously wants to keep an eye on her as she mixes these drinks, but he's also starting to look at her with a different kind of interest. Meanwhile, Wanley is waiting anxiously for word from Alice. 
It's remarkable how much silent acting Robinson does in this movie, having to hold the screen without dialogue. We left Alice with a wonderful expression of mingled suspicion and speculation, and we go back to find the mood has changed dramatically. From a band will be a sentence to make South America, and that's all there is to it. I thought... If you thought what? If you thought what? Have you any more money than that? Keep it. But why? Take a look at the mirror, beautiful. And if you're thinking of somebody else, don't be a sucker. In a jam like this, you gotta look out for yourself first. I suppose so. Do you think he'd think of you if he had an out? When are we leave? The sooner the better. Tomorrow morning? Tonight would be better. Would it make a great deal of difference? Not if it's positive for tomorrow morning. Oh, I'll have to do some phoning. I can't have some people I know running around with the police getting excited about the disappearance. Yeah, you'll have to watch that. I have to think of some kind of explanation. Is it a deal, then? I guess so. I guess it is. All right. Give me a kiss. Since Lang famously blocked out his actor's movements and gestures, we know he came up with that very weird kiss where Bennett has to climb on top of Duryea, a perfect dramatization of the way that he is so much in control here that he can't be bothered to move from the armchair to kiss her. I'm sure Lang enjoyed staging that, just as he reportedly loved choreographing murders and fights. Say, There's a somewhat disturbing the photograph coast. of him showing Duryea how to beat up Bennett, possibly on the set of well, Scarlet Street, go. although it could be from this you movie, really since this? as we see, even though he's willing to forego the money to get settled, Alice instead, That's he's still suspicious of her, and she's about to mean? overplay her hand you with take. the drinks. We never saw her I've put anything mine. in his drink, but we now know that she one, did. Of course, we're completely on Alice's side What's here, wanting her to get away Nothing. with this because she's in such a tough right, spot. Drink it. It's worth stopping to think for a moment that we are rooting for murder. That's one of the things that Noir does all the time, is mess with our moral compass. What do you I said before for? that Some film kid? noir was able to sneak mean. moral ambiguity and ambivalence back into movies during the production code era by following the letter of the law but not the spirit. This worked because the enforcers of the code, people usually talk about the Hayes office, in fact in this era it was run by Joe Breen, a devout Catholic and virulent anti-Semite. They were quite now obtuse the in their of understanding of there the way any. people experience movies. Like school, get they the seemed to think that as long quick. as you show that crime doesn't pay, Come that on. people can't get away with murder and that they're always punished for their transgressions, audiences will be morally uplifted and go away determined to lead virtuous law-abiding lives. They didn't seem to pay attention to where the audience's sympathy lies. If a movie mattress. made a superficial show of having the police be the good guys, they didn't seem to realize that actually the audience is rooting for the doomed criminals or the gangsters, and thereby having their moral standards lowered. Or they're being presented with a situation like this, where no one is really in the right. How could you lie to Patty like that? How did you think you could get away with it? Will you go now? In the Where case of go? this film, sure. the framing of it all being first, a dream seems to have satisfied the censors, and what this dream might be do. saying about I'm what goes on in people's minds dope, apparently didn't Another bother them. Five grand by tomorrow night. How do you like that? Surprisingly <sighs> enough, Scarlet Street, you. which is considerably I more sordid than this film, and has a very it. different, more and uncompromising ending, didn't night. have much trouble with the censors either. Lang noted that both he so and Breen were Catholics and had a similar outlook on punishment, so that the fact that the characters suffer, as Alice is suffering in this scene, makes it okay that these are films about adultery and murder. The way that Hyde is so gleeful in sneering at this amateurish attempt to outsmart him, the way he humiliates her, is almost worse than his smacking her around. 
He's an evangelist for the noir philosophy of looking out for yourself and trusting no one. Just naturally what you call a cynic, honey, as he said earlier. Professor? Something He's elegant gone. in this scene is the gone. way when Alice calls gone. Wanley. There's a long close-up of his face, and we don't hear what she is saying. Of course, we already know what she's telling him. We just hear the clock ticking. This is more silent acting from I Robinson. See. And in this scene, he completes yeah. the arc that his character has taken from the cheerful, naive, and almost cocky demeanor at the beginning to this I ultimate bottoming out of silent, on. exhausted despair. He's gone from complaining about the end of the brightness of life, the end of adventure, to being completely I'm drained so and tired out from dealing with this situation. Where she is desperate and panic, Where he seems hopeless and resigned. Very Something to think about me. here is that she is actually what the one who's now? on the spot. Height has no I idea who idea. Wanley is, so his only risk of getting caught is if I'm she betrays him. But the way the pictures of his family now appear prominently suggests the sense of guilt and shame, and awareness that he cannot continue to lead this double life, is what's driving him now to consider ending it all. It's easy to trace certain elements of noir. The visual style came largely from German Expressionism. The plots drew mainly on American hard-boiled pulp fiction of the 1930s. But where does this overwhelming sense of disillusionment and of pessimism and defeatism come from? Is it a holdover from the Great Depression? A submerged response to the war lurking under the official propaganda about everyone pulling together for victory? Is it something that exiles and refugees brought with them from Europe? It's probably a combination of all these things. This shot of him walking away with the camera staying behind him and seeing him pass through one door after another is again a beautiful and very symbolic image. The fact that Lang publicly said that the audience should never notice the camera work, something a lot of Hollywood directors felt compelled to say, does not stop him from including shots that are arresting. And it's not as if a shot like that distracts the audience's involvement in the story. It doesn't take us out of the narrative. On the contrary, it pulls the audience further into the story by heightening the emotion. I will say that for my taste, the music in this film by Arthur Lang is a little too insistent in underlining the mood of the scenes. It can feel almost heavy-handed in the manner of the voiceover narration in other 40s films. They really did not want to leave audiences in any doubt about what was going on. But this sudden gunshot is one thing in the film that's not foreshadowed or prepared for at all. Because we were just watching Ronnie prepare to poison himself, we might connect this with the idea of suicide, but in fact the police had caught up with Hype, who we just saw disappear into the alley. This is a very standard studio backlot New York street, very typical of what appears in countless movies before the fad for location shooting starts in the post-war years. There's something about the artificiality and the claustrophobia of these settings that works perfectly for movies like this. The lack of real street life, the awareness that the people you see are extras goes with the paranoia and the sense of being framed. Because it's a set, you never get long vistas. Notice how all the ends of the streets are blocked off. You never see the sky. You have a sense of people hemmed in, like they are trapped in a diorama of the dark city. And this black basement where Height meets his end, next to the trash cans, is the one quintessential noir location in the film. Naturally, Durier dies in a great many of his films. In westerns, he had something of a specialty in flamboyant death scenes. You could probably count the number of happy endings for his characters on the fingers of one hand. Even when he played more sympathetic roles, as in Black Angel or The Burglar, he was almost never heroic. Indeed, he tends to be much happier in his villainous roles than in his more likable ones who are often troubled or tormented and self-pitying. He was especially effective as an alcoholic, something he played in Black Angel, The Great Flammarion, and Chicago Calling, because he has the ability to seem totally spineless and jellied, yet also suggest intelligence and complex character that is paralyzed by his weakness. 
The irony of the police assuming he killed Mazur, meaning he's being blamed for a crime he didn't commit rather than one he did, is a pattern that will be repeated almost exactly in Scarlet Street. Now comes a moment of big suspense as Alice runs off to telephone Wanley, though she doesn't know he is possibly committing suicide at this moment we do. And this shot of her from the outside, passing through a series of doors, echoes the recent one of Wanley. We've seen before how this movie uses contrasts between bursts of rapid action and then much slower paced scenes. This is another example. After that exciting scene in Alice's sprint across the street, this scene is now agonizingly prolonged as she tries to reach Wanley and we are left wondering if it is too late and he has ironically killed himself just before being saved. Here the suspense music gives way to the much more effective ringing of the phone with no accompaniment. The use again of the family photos to remind us why he's done this and underscore the tragedy. And then this very deliberate pan over to Wanley, who will struggle to reach for the phone but doesn't have the strength. What if this were the real ending, if we watched this man die knowing all his problems were actually over, if we just got this shot of Robinson and then the end? We would undoubtedly feel this was grossly excessive punishment for what he'd done, and perhaps that the irony was too much, but most fans of noir would probably relish its sheer pessimism as they do with Detour. This is the moment when we transition back from the dream to Wanley waking up, and Lang was extremely proud of the way this scene was shot. Notice there is no cut for the transition between him sitting in his living room in a smoking jacket, apparently dead, and then waking up in the club in his suit. In order to do that, Lang had the camera go in for a close-up on his face while crew members whisked off his breakaway jacket and the set split in half and moved away to reveal the other set, so that when the camera pulls back, his location and costume have changed. Once you're looking for it, you can notice that the chair is the same chair, and that we see only a very small bit of the set of the living room, not the full one. Of course, this is done so smoothly that the viewer is unlikely to notice anything. You don't have the sense that it's a bravura shot, but it enhances the surprise when that hand comes out and wakes him, it's much more elegantly done than the typical sort of soft focus ripply effect used to indicate someone falling asleep or waking up. In this little postscript scene, Lang goes even further in undermining the seriousness of the movie by adding this sort of Wizard of Oz touch of having some of the characters in the dream appear as figures in the club. If you really wanted to be Freudian about it, you'd have to wonder what kind of dark fears Wanley has of the hat check man and the doorman that led him to cast them as such menacing figures in his dream, but I don't think that's the intention. It's more a way of wiping out that darkness. Notice the straw boater of the kind Mazard wore on the rack behind Arthur Locke. This comic tone for instance, the silly line when he tells the hat check man, I can't tell you how glad I am to see you alive, is what many critics of the time objected to. Almost all reviewers panned this as a cheat or a letdown, though Lang liked to say that the happy ending meant a million dollars more in receipts for the film, which may be true, though it has somewhat marred the film's reputation in the long run. Lang always put tremendous thought and care into the beginnings and endings of his films. So for a final coda, we go back to the window, for a sequence that almost exactly replicates the shot sequence and framing of the earlier one where he met Alice. Lang liked to say he ended the picture with a healthy laugh, with this scene where Wanley is approached by a streetwalker and runs like a rabbit. I can't say the laugh really works for me. The idea that he has learned his lesson about pursuing adventure, though in a painless way that involved no actual consequences, is not very satisfying, and the presentation of Iris Adrian as a cheap tart and the butt of the joke seems a bit cruel. But this is a small blot on what is overall a very well-balanced mixture of entertainment and food for thought. I hope you agree. Thank you for listening.